that I'm going to talk about my experience dying five times in one day. At the age of 19, I became a police officer, very young, in the state of New Jersey. And I saw a lot of things, you know, the, you know, the dark side of the world. And, you know, there's a reason why I share this with you, Prom. Stay with me here. My grandmother passed in my early 20s, and she was, you know, the one who raised me. She was one out of nine sisters, and she was the poorest and hardworking. When uh, God took her, I was very resentful, very pissed, very angry. How dare you? Cursing the whole nine because she was like my mother figure. And I had a lot of personal resentment. Uh, at the age of 28, I started in finance. And at the age of 30, I left the police department after 12 years of service to run my business. That's where I met my wife. You know, we have three children together today. Uh, but even in business, my wife would play Christian music or she would talk about God. And I just shut up. I didn't want to hear it. And, um, I would go through the motions because she was going to church and as a supportive husband, that's the best I can do. But it was fighting through teeth and nail, right? They didn't want to be part of anything. I was super effing upset and very resentful. And then seeing the world from the dark side, you know, nobody calls you, says, hey, I'm having a great day. No, they call you because there's mishap in their life and they need our help. When my grandfather died two years later. I just was pissed, very resentful. I just didn't care for, for God or Jesus or whoever it was at that time. And then um, fast forward, going through this for majority of my life, you know, at the age of 41, from the age of, you know, early 20s, I'm there's not a battle. I just didn't want to hear it. I wasn't even going to try to battle it. They didn't care for it. And then uh, on March 23rd, 2020, that's when my incident happened where I woke up on the floor gasping for air. Uh, by the way, I went to bed perfectly fine. It feels like when you breathe out and someone's kicking, kicking you in the chest. And I wish that pain about nobody. And I'm just gasping for air. I remember in my training as an officer, if I get in the fetal position, uh, you know, breathing would get easier, which it did just a little bit. But now I'm very comfortable on the floor in the fetal position, breathing, uh, not knowing my wife fills in the gaps not knowing that I already turned blue, not knowing 911 was already called. And I remember the police officer showing up, he showed up with the EMTs and the cop was, you know, typical questions. I didn't want to get up. I was very comfortable. And he said, he, I remember him reaching out his hand and him saying, if you don't get the fuck up, you're going to die. here." And that's when I said, okay, you know, in my head, I put my arm out. He reached, pulled me up. And that's the last thing I remember. In my testimony, there's two sides. There's my wife's side, because she fills in the blanks, and then there's mine. So I'm. do you want to hear both, or do you just want my side? I stand, he pulls me up. That's the last thing I remember. Now I'm in floating in black space. Now think about you laying in bed, and I pull the bed from you, and you're floating in black space. As I'm in this spiritual realm floating in black space, she says... Uh, they put me on the stair chair. They carried me downstairs. They kept yelling at me not to grab the walls. I was coherent on earth in conversation. And finally, I looked back at her and I said to her, honey, I, I'm, you know, I'm so tired and I'm sorry. And that's when my eyes rolled back. And that was her first experience of me dying the first time. I was put on a, I was rushed on the steps. I was put on the stretcher. CPR started, they put me on the ambulance, they continued CPR. I came back about 15 minutes later. And again, this is all on my wife's side of her perspective. I promise you I'll get to mine. They brought me back, they were about to take off, and then I went again. Uh, the second time I was probably dead about 40 minutes plus because they had to put a machine on me uh, for CPR. And finally, they stabilized me. I started breathing again, and that's when they took off to the uh, to the hospital. There was no choice of hospital. You had to go to the nearest one due to my situation. And then I find out, because as a first responder myself, we never get closure, but I did go see the guys that kept me alive. And uh, I learned that I actually showed up to the hospital dead as well. I'm in the hospital. I remember 
my wife, because it's COVID, it's New Jersey, everything shut down. My wife was not able to spend time with me next to the bed. She had to come in like every hour for five minutes. They gave her that courtesy because my wife is a retired EMT. I showed up to the hospital dead. Everything was locked down because it was New Jersey. So my wife couldn't come in and spend time with me. I don't remember anything. But she mentions that she came in and she was in my ear and she was like, don't you dare flip and die on me. I'm too young to be a widow. You better get your, you know, your hiney up and, you know, come back. And then she killed me, right? Because I went again. I passed again. Finally, the nurses were telling her you should say your, your, your goodbyes because we don't know what's wrong with him. Our spiritual mentor called her and he told her, you need to go in there and speak life into him. That's what you need to do. That's the adversary playing with you. Don't listen to the nurses. You need to go in there and speak life into him. And um, she comes in. She starts praying on the top of her lungs. And her eyes are closed. And she opens them. And then she sees the whole staff, the medical staff, because they heard her praying so loud over my bed. The nursing staff is literally around my bed in prayer with her. It worked. I'm still here. An opening opened up in the hospital. They rushed me to ICU and she didn't get a chance to say bye to me after that because they asked her to remove herself and the opening happened and then I went up to ICU. Uh, so all this is happening on earth. Let me share with you what's happening in the spiritual realm. I'm floating in black space and from the right side of my foot, a figure starts to fade in. And when the figure fades in, I'm like, it's Jesus. I'm so sorry. That's what I said. I'm so sorry because I felt like an idiot. Like I said, I'm sorry. You're real. And he, and he, he fades in and he, he floats around my feet. And then he comes to this side of me and then he puts his arms underneath me like the wedding carry. So here I am, this big guy. And he's holding me and it was clear as day shannon i can tell you he's about six foot one he's not black and he's not white he's probably a, a shade darker than olive and uh he's got a pointy nose thin lips sharp jawline deep eyes hair down to the shoulders uh it was so clear that i can see the lining in his cloth and when i looked into his eyes i felt a sense of peace I felt a, a huge, overwhelming sense of peace and love. And at that point, I just knew that I was going to be okay. We didn't speak. We spoke through emotion. Because when he felt that I felt that, he, 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 he gave me like one of these, like, and that was it. And then he just took his arms away from under me. He turned around. And he walked in and he faded into the darkness. I then get brought up on my feet and now I'm floating like a ghost. And uh, I see a gentleman by the name of Mark. Now, Mark, the backstory is uh, I was Mark's financial consultant. But Mark and I were police officers together. And Mark died from a tragic accident back in 2017. And Mark was always the guy that would always call me up. Hey, am I going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? If something happens to me, is my wife going to be taken care of? And eventually I told Mark, I said, Mark, I'm, I'm, I promise you, if I'm still here, I'm going to effing take care of you. Don't worry about it. I see Mark and he's like, Bobby, I'm like, Mark. And I glided over to him and then we were just talking. So I told Mark, I said, Mark, if, if I'm still here, don't worry. I got you. I got you. That's exactly what I said. It was, I got you. Well, when Mark passed and I'm seeing him in the spiritual realm, it's one of those like, Mark, he's like, oh, we, and I glided closer to him and he, we hugged each other and we started talking about earth. We were just talking like life continued somewhere else. And I saw Mark in the last image that I remembered. And in our conversation, he's like, I said, Mark, did you, and this is what I told him. Mark, did you see what we did? He's like, yes, I saw everything. I'm so, thank you so much. You know, and he was very grateful. And I remember slapping him on the chest and I said, I, 
told you that I got you. We helped each other. You know, he was very grateful. My time with him was very short. But at no point did we talk about being dead. At no point did we talk about, like, what are you doing here? It was just life continued, but we were talking about Earth. We embraced each other, and uh, he faded away. I faded away. And then I woke up in ICU. Now, when I woke up in ICU, it was nine days later. However, my experience felt 10 minutes. And it was nine days later. I woke up with a full beard and all. In ICU, I wake up. No one tells me what happened to me. It was like, hey, Bobby, you passed. We brought you back. You're in ICU. Your family's okay. Nothing. It was it was just pure chaos. I mean, I remember seeing doctors running through in the hallway and the patients being running in the hallway. It was pure chaos. This is the adverse area playing with you. First person I saw was this Asian gentleman who was fully geared up. And he just comes in and we're like, hey, Robert, no one told me what the heck happened. Nothing at all. So I get in defense mode. The Jersey cop comes out. I'm getting in defense mode. I'm fighting everybody. I don't let them touch me. I do a self-assessment of, of my body. And then I realize that I can't bend my left leg. So I'm like, there goes that. I can't even get up and fight. I start watching TV and on TV, they talk about COVID. I'm like, I remember COVID. Probably I had COVID, which I didn't for the record. It tested me about eight or nine times, never had. I couldn't move my left leg. I was watching TV and it was the news and they talked about COVID. Now I remember, I said, oh, I remember COVID. I remember that. I said, maybe I had COVID. For the record, never had it. I'm singing, if I have COVID, that's my weapon because I felt the tube here. Now it's it was a, a temporary permit cap or dialysis. I said, I'm going to take the tube out and spread the medical staff. And that's how they're going to stay away from me. I did go for the tube several times, not knowing I was going to kill myself like that. And the staff would come in, Robert, don't you do that? So forth and so forth. So I'm thinking the staff is trying to kill me. I'm thinking that they're going to try to steal, steal my organs. Too many movies, I guess. I'm sleep deprived because I refuse to sleep. I'm food deprived because I'm, you know, I'm thinking they made poison. And this is going on for two, two and a half days. And all of a sudden, it's late at night. And it was nighttime because, you know, you, you start putting two and two together. It's the same nurse at nighttime. It's dark outside. And, I'm, you know, I, I know I'm starting to learn the routines. She's on the right side of my bed. And this gentleman walks in, a black male, in lime green scrubs. Never seen anybody in the hospital with lime green uh, green scrubs. He walks over to me. He goes to put his hand on my wrist, my left wrist. And the first thing that comes out of my mouth is cough. Who are you? It's exactly what I said. When he goes to touch me, he says, hello, my son, how are you? And that's what I said, get all, get, who are you? And he said, I'm here because your wife is outside that window every evening at seven o'clock with your children praying for he said, I, I'm praying for you too. And I respond to him, are you praying for me, boy? Who the heck are you, right? And he says, I'm a prayer warrior. And your wife said, and when I heard that, the only person who ever mentioned the word prayer warrior was my wife. I could hear my wife speak through this gentleman. And I felt that sense of peace again. I just took one of those like, and I said, fine, I'll stop fighting. I'll accept treatment so forth and so forth. and he goes thank you and he goes I'll and he goes to touch my wrist again this time I let him and I said uh he said oh, I'll see you soon my son and he walks out the nurse over here never acknowledged him they never acknowledge each other but it's ICU right everything's documented who comes in who goes out so two weeks after that I'm coherent I know that I died five times in one day I know that everything has happened to me and so I tell I tell that to my wife that experience and she's like oh okay and she calls the hospital she became good friends with the staff she calls the hospital up long story short the name of the gentleman was Kendrick there's no Kendrick she would try her best to find out because she wanted to thank him Kendrick so there's no Kendrick and it hits my wife she says I prayed for Jesus 
to show up in the flesh and calm you down so you're willing to be treated. She put two and two together. And that was probably Kendra. So what did I learn from my experience? I mean, there's so much, there's so much, you know, I'm giving you the meats and potatoes here. What did I learn from my experience? Number one, God is real. You, you can't tell me he's not. Some people say, well, it's the medication. I read a book of a neurosurgeon, I'm sorry, a neurologist who was brain dead and saw Jesus. So God is real. When we don't die, by the way, we pass. We don't die, we pass. And when we pass over, we lose five emotions. We lose worry, doubt, fear, pain, and suffering. I'll say it again, worry, doubt, fear, pain, and suffering. So when you lose a loved one through pain, it's gone. When you really think about these five things we lose, we're actually born with one of them, which is fear. And the only two fears we're actually born with, in my opinion, are the fear of falling and the fear of loud noise. Everything else has influenced it. So we lose that. However, when we transition over and we pass, we gain tranquility, like paradise. We gain peace. And the big one here is we gain love. The love is overwhelming. It's not like when you first had your first child. It's not the love when you're, you're with your significant other. This love is indescribable. It's like a woman trying to tell me what it is to give birth. Can't get it. I have to go through that process to understand. It's the same love that you get when you cross. It's through you. It's around you. There's no way escaping it. I remember coming back to life and two, three weeks later, I told my wife, I don't mind dying again because it's, it's so beautiful and it's so pure. It's like, it's like, you know, like means like, that's what that love feels like. Sometimes I pray to feel that love in my sleep. It doesn't happen. So I learned that when we transition over, that there's that love waiting for us and there's nothing to be afraid about when it comes to the unknown. I know what the other side is. I can tell people what the other side is and based on my experience and bring them peace. And everybody who I speak to, Shannon, I always get the testimony in because I don't know where other people in their life. And um, it's just beautiful. Dying is beautiful. You may not even know you're dead. I don't know. Um, because I am only able to share this with you because I came back. But when I was Mark, I didn't know I was dead. It's like a blanket. It's like a, a drink. It's, it, you know, what do you want in it? I want peace, tranquility, and love. It's all in one. It's hard to explain. And that's why I said it's like giving birth. It's hard to explain. I said to him, I'm sorry, as soon as I saw him, to Jesus. I said, you know, when I heard Jesus fade in, I, and I said, oh my God, you're real. I'm so sorry. And, you know, as forgiving as he is, he still gave me that peace and love. Today, life is very different for me. Before, I was very aggressive. I still have aggressive attitude, but I was always busy with looking. I was very uh, aggressive in every demeanor. Let's put, just put it that way. Today, life is very different for me, and it's because of my experience with Jesus. I am a big believer today. I go to church. I always share my testimony with everybody who I engage in conversation because I don't know what other people are going through, but I will tell you that I've gotten some great feet where, you know, somebody is like, oh, my husband is dying or I'm concerned. This was a client. I'm concerned that my father didn't cross over and I can see her father. And I just, you know, and I don't describe People that I do see, I don't describe it where it's very general, like, oh, yeah, two eyeballs. No, I describe detail that only that person would know to, because what happened to me, Shannon, there's no instructions, right? So we're always looking for validation. So when I describe someone who does come into the picture, it's very to the T, like, like only things you would know. Sometimes I do know when people are going to pass. I do get messages. How I know the messages are real is because I get overwhelmed emotionally and I start crying and that's how I know they're real because if it's the adversary I'm straight faced I'm like I'm not saying that because I know it's not you I don't stress the small stuff like if I can give somebody advice about life stop stress the first thing I tell people is number one is amend the relationships that you haven't amended when I woke up I didn't have the best 
relationship with my biological mother and my stepfather and my biological father. Those are the three people that I called. Just because I changed, it doesn't mean that they are. But now our relationships are respectful. Because remember, forgiveness is not for them, it's for you. At the end of the day. So amend those relationships with people in your life that you have. Because you want to make sure your closet is clean before you go. And you don't know when you're going to. That's number one. Number two, don't sweat the small stuff. It's not that important. It's not. I'm telling you, it's not. Number three, if your family, your loved one, or your children want to spend time with you, drop what you're doing. You don't know when the clock is up. There's times I'm on appointments on Zoom with clients and my son wants to hang out or play video games. I, I don't know how much more time I have with my son. I don't know when the, the next deadline, my sixth deadline is coming, right? Your job is not that important. And last, and this one's big, the quicker you know that you're not in control of your life and Jesus and God are, the easier life gets. If something doesn't happen for you, there's another door opening up that you just need to keep your eyes open. Just trust the process, trust the plan. At the end, it's all going to work. And the, I know it's very hard for many of us to believe in that, However, I will tell you that I just shrug my shoulders when things doesn't go my way. Okay, all right. That's part of the plan. And it's less stressful. That's pretty much it.